Hello, and thank you for joining us on a slightly soggy October evening uh, to share with us some of your time, some of your feelings, and perhaps some of your ideas for the future. My name is Ben, and I'm the USU Students' Union Chief Executive. It's my job to facilitate and encourage the voice of elected student officers and of students. So I'm going to be doing that this evening by chairing this webinar. We are very rapidly moving through the first term towards a winter break and the new 2021 year. We wanted to take this chance to have an honest conversation about COVID, to try and ensure that we understand some of the challenges you face, to try and hear some of the questions you might have, and to perhaps hear your ideas and your ambition for the coming months and terms ahead. We want to work with you to plot a path through the winter and to build some collective hope and optimism for the future. Very shortly, I'll be handing over for some brief opening remarks that will set the scene a little bit. Um, I'll be handing over to Charlie, the University Vice Chancellor. Uh, Charlie's gonna be followed by Tracy, the University Pro Vice Chancellor for Teaching, Learning and Students. And then we're gonna hear from two of your elected student officers, um, Carly, the USU Community and Wellbeing Officer, and Perna, the president of the York Graduate Students Association. The majority of this though, is to hear your questions and your ideas and to discuss them with a panel of experts who I will introduce shortly. You're gonna be able to submit questions and suggestions using the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'm gonna be asking the most popular questions. And so as well as submitting questions, please do take the opportunity to like the questions that you particularly want to hear some responses and engagement with. I will ask those that are the most popular. So for now, I'm going to hand over to Charlie. Thank you very much, Ben, and thanks uh, all of you for, for joining us uh, tonight. Um, uh, I'd like to say it's good to see you, but uh, I, I can't say that, uh, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, this is a year uh, like no other, uh, and it's an academic year like no other. Uh, we're all having to adapt uh, and to live with uncertainty as the pandemic evolves with all of its health, social and economic impacts, and with what can seem like a constant change in the guidelines we need to follow both generally uh, and in university settings. It's very clear now that we're deep in a second wave of the pandemic, which is hitting especially hard in Europe, including in the UK. Uh, we've had over 20,000 new COVID positive cases per day in the UK for the last week or so, and no sign yet uh, of that tailing off. Uh, the National Health Service is under real strain in some parts of the country. Uh, as the numbers of those getting seriously ill uh, with the virus rises and as the number of deaths sadly uh, grows. Uh, the UK government response for England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have their own rules. The response for England has been to introduce local area tiers of restriction. Uh, tier one is the one in which general restrictions apply, for example, the rule of six and hospitality venues having to close at 10 p.m. Tier two uh, has a main additional restriction uh, of a ban on household mixing indoors. Uh, and tier three additionally prohibits household mixing outdoors and has uh, tighter restrictions on hospitality uh, businesses. York, uh, the city of York, was recently moved from tier one to tier two, and indeed much of the country uh, is now under those higher tiers. Uh, it was moved because of an increase in COVID cases in the city, but also an increase in the positivity rate, that is the proportion of COVID tests coming back as positives. A uh, significant, but by no means the only part of that, has been the growth of COVID cases at the University of York, but also at York, York St. John University in the city. I'm pleased to say that our case levels at the University of York are now lower than at their peak. We seem to have passed a peak. Uh, we can't be complacent, though. We, we do need to follow uh, the rules, however irksome they can be. The rule of six, generally, uh, hands face 
space, washing hands frequently, uh, face coverings, keeping our distance from others, but also self-isolating and getting a test uh, when, when people appear with symptoms. And additionally, now we have no household mixing indoors. Uh, for those who need to self-isolate, uh, we will continue to give uh, the support we have been giving, uh, access to uh, essential provisions and services, uh, contact points so we know how people are, uh, and measures for uh, well-being, both around mental health and well-being, but more generally um, recreational activity online for those having to self-isolate. Now, if a local area uh, needs to move to a different tier, as York did, uh, universities are required by the UK government to review their position on a different set of tiers set out by the Department for Education. Now, we decided we should move the university up one tier in the Department for Education system, which means in practice that the amount of online teaching for most programmes will increase, um, while in-person teaching uh, remains at a lower level. That was a decision about balance. On one side of the equation were three factors. Uh, firstly, our city has moved into a higher risk level. And while we have no evidence of any virus transmission in classroom settings, which as you will know, are heavily regulated and risk assessed, it may be that the movement to and from classrooms holds some level of, of risk of transmission. Secondly, uh, we, we know that the level of confidence some staff and some students have had in our risk mitigations uh, has not been as high as we would like, especially one metre social distancing uh, in classrooms. Again, we have no evidence of risk of transmission in the classroom, but we know some have felt uncomfortable uh, with that distancing. And then thirdly, we've had a, a significant logistical challenge of delivering teaching intended for in-person settings when the number of students having to self-isolate has been significant. Those factors all pressed for change. But on the other side of the equation, uh, we know um, firstly that we prize as a university in-person teaching. We know that the government secondly uh, is keen for in-person teaching to continue where it's safe to do so. And we know thirdly that the majority of students who've answered our surveys want to continue with a blended mix of in-person and online teaching. There are good reasons for that educationally, but also for student well-being, for ensuring not just intellectual, but social interaction outside of a college flat or a student house in the city. Looking to balance those factors, we came to that decision to increase the proportion of online teaching while maintaining in-person teaching and the other facilities that the university and its students provide uh, on campus. We can't have the usual experience this year, even uh, less so as the pandemic has worsened, but we do want to maintain as much of an in-person experience on campus as we can. I understand all of this is unsettling, it's not what any of us would want, but we are in an utterly unprecedented situation uh, and we will do what we can to make that best to make the best of that situation for you. And with those general words, I'm going to hand over now to Tracy uh, Lightfoot, who will say uh, a little more about the changes to teaching uh, that will be introduced uh, as of next week. Thanks, Charlie, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. So as Charlie's outlined um, what a transition to DfE tier two means. So I'm going to talk through with you why we've had a transition this week and where we're up to in relation to what happens next week. So firstly, what has this week been about? Well, three things. Firstly, we've had to stop the majority of in-person teaching to allow for parts of the campus to be reconfigured to two metres, having taken on board those concerns about the one metre plus social distancing from both staff and students, as Charlie's already alluded to. Secondly, we wanted to make sure we've optimised all of the space available to us across both campuses, east and west, as well as related to King's Manor. And clearly that takes us some time to do. And finally, based on the feedback we've received from our students, both via the last webinar and from the pulse surveys, which indicates a preference for a blended approach to our teaching and learning, 
We've asked our departments to go back and revisit the plans they'd made and to review and rework those um, for DfE Tier 2. Collectively, we've been working exceptionally hard on this last point, to be in a position to offer as much in-person campus teaching as we can from next week in accordance with our available space. We're almost there with those plans now and your departments have been really creative in what they're offering and we strongly encourage you to engage with these activities for the rest of the academic term. Whilst these will provide some excellent opportunities for learning and being part of learning communities, they also provide you with a chance to mix with your peers outside of your living arrangements. I was chatting with a couple of colleagues earlier today and we were reminiscing about our own time at university, the friends we made, many of whom were those we met during seminars and labs. And in fact, two of my closest friends were in the same study group as me for chemistry, and we bonded over making the equipment work properly and writing up our lab books. So it's about that whole integrated student experience and the health and well-being as well. We really appreciate your patience about what will happen next week and your timetables will be able to direct you to the right place, either online or on campus, if you wish to choose that option. And further communications will be coming out to all students tomorrow. But the messages look at that timetable and please engage. Our departments have worked hard to create with you those in-campus opportunities that you've been um, noting have been a really important part of your university life here. I'm now going to hand over to Carly, who's going to talk more from the USU point of view. I apologise, my mic was still muted. I'm Carly, the Community and Wellbeing Officer, and we also have Matt, our Academic Officer, here with us. We're here to represent USU and answer your questions regarding to Matt's impact on your wellbeing and your ability to access and be successful in your studies. We sit on a variety of boards within the university, covering matters from access and participation, academic contingency, all the way through to student life and opportunities. We also work with a variety of student groups to get your voices heard, primarily through our academic reps and the liberation networks within our roles. We just want to acknowledge the current pressure students are facing, particularly as we come up to the common assessment period in January, as learning has vastly changed and it's more important than ever that us as a union and a university are providing you with the correct support to help you make connections with other people in the community and support you in your studies. With the name of keeping this short and sweet, um, I'd like to hand over to Pern now, who will discuss the GSA's perspective. Thank you, Carly. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Pernur, the president of the GSA and uh, the Postgraduate Students Union here at the University of York. At the GSA, we have been working to ensure that our postgraduate students are still able to build the community that we know is incredibly important to you and to enable you to engage with your studies. We have a number of established groups that we uh, and we have 12 student-led networks that are supported by the GSA to provide regular events that will continue throughout December and January, as we know postgraduates don't really conform to the usual university terms. Our free informal sports session have just started this week, so please sign up for them if you are interested. In addition to that, we also have our advice service, which is available to, to offer support to, and advice to anyone who might need it. So please do use that if you need to. As ever, the sabbatical officer team continues to represent you in numer numerous uh, meetings regarding all aspects of students' life across the university. To raise your voices, whether it's in academic matters, well-being support, accommodation, or financial issues. We are here to listen and amplify your voices and to help combat <clears throat> issues that you are facing. Thank you. Thanks ever so much for those opening remarks. Um, could I ask the, the, the panelists to turn on their cameras and I'll briefly introduce them and then we're going to go straight to questions uh, that the faces we can see on the screen. We've, we've got Matt Johnson, who is the uh, USU Students Union Academic Officer. We've got Paula Tunbridge, who is the University Director of Student Life and Wellbeing. Uh, we've got Dean Spears, who is the Director of Campus Services. Um, we have Jill Webb, uh, I'm just checking, we have got Jill Webb, yes, that's right, uh, Associate Dean for Learning, Teaching and Students for the Faculty of Social Sciences, um, and she also teaches in the Management School, um, and we've got Jane Baston, who's the York GSA Academic Affairs Officer, 
Um, I think I haven't missed any. Oh, Ian Wiggins, who is the Strategic Projects Director. I've nearly, forgot, nearly forgot you, Ian, apologies. Um, so without further ado, I'm, I'm gonna go straight to the questions. The top question at the moment, I believe, is, is, uh, is put as, as follows. Um, why are students being kept in the dark about the amount of cases within the university population? And I, and I think I'll go straight to Charlie on that one, please. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, uh, I don't think anybody's being kept in the dark. Uh, we are publishing the case count on a daily basis. Um, uh, and you can find that on the smart, supportive and safe uh, website web pages, which are which are our portal for information uh, about uh, all, all things to do with uh, COVID. Uh, I can probably ask Ian Wiggins, Ben, if that's OK, to say a little bit more about how we uh, collect that information uh, in, in detail. Um, but but um, we certainly publish every day the information we have on the amount of COVID cases uh, at the university. Yeah, happy to add some more to that. So we're publishing two statistics every day, uh, Monday to Friday. We're publishing the, the new cases each day. And that is the number of cases that have been reported to us by staff and students. So it's going to vary a little bit to the numbers that you'll see in terms of positive cases in the University in Heslington Ward and places like that, because uh, depending on where a student's postcode is still registered to it, it, it might not trigger as a, as a York case, but has nonetheless been reported to us. And then we're also publishing the total number of active cases. And what we mean by active cases is students and staff who are uh, have tested positive for COVID and they are still in a period of isolation. So a, a new case might not feature in the active cases for the full 14 days because people don't always tell us on day one uh, of their isolation. Indeed, some people have been in isolation for a while uh, and then uh, test positive or, or inform the university at a later date. But we're publishing both of those data um, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, and those are up, as, as Charlie mentions, on the coronavirus website uh, for the university. And given that the data is only really as good as what, what students are willing to share with us, uh, you know, we know it's important for, for students to talk with us. That allows us to support them. That allows us to know and acknowledge and share the fact that they are unwell, perhaps, or, or, or isolating. Pa Paula, can you just talk us through exactly how students can uh, alert the university to the fact that they are either isolating or, or taking a test and, and have perhaps come back COVID positive? Thanks, Ben. Yes. I mean, we absolutely are encouraging students to, to, to make us aware because we do want to provide that support to you. And um, obviously there is the um, self-isolation form and that's the one that we need you to fill in. That's on the main COVID pages. Um, the Student Hub as well will be the team that will be connecting and reaching out to you as a result of filling out that form. And we'll be able to support you with things like um, if you need to get food delivered, uh, if you need to get medicines delivered to you because you, you're self-isolating. And there will be well, well-being and welfare calls from your college team as well. So absolutely encourage all students to, to make us aware through that form. Uh, I know there's been some some feedback that people were a bit hesitant maybe um, to, to talk to us, but we absolutely, it's about us supporting you because uh, we know it'll be quite a scary time. So please do let us know. Thanks very much. Um, the next most uh, popular question that I'm going to ask is uh, has come through and it's about accommodation. Um, it's rather beautifully phrased, so I'm going to read it all if that's all right. Um, they've said, I'm curious if the university's opinion on refunding or reducing accommodation fees has changed since the last webinar. It was irresponsible for the university to encourage students to return, especially in large amounts, such as 20 per household, before they had received their timetables. Personally, I know that I regret booking on-campus accommodation given that I am, the I am only experiencing face-to-face -face teaching once per week. It is much cheaper and safer for me to stay at home and commute, but I am trapped in a contract that was signed before I even received my timetable. So that there's quite a lot in there. There's some stuff around what is the policy for helping people who perhaps decided that they would feel safer elsewhere. And there's some stuff in there about the, the, the blend and availability of face-to-face -face opportunities. So if it's all right, I'll go to Dean Spears first to talk us through how we handle those, those cases where students' plans might have changed, perhaps. 
Thanks very much, Ben. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about the work of the university's accommodation team who really want to help. Uh, and I've got three points to, to bring out which might help uh, the question. Where a student has worked with us, we have worked with them to agree a package to leave, to do so safely and without being charged for the full academic year. If a student has concerns that they wish to leave University of York accommodation, they just need to speak with us to the accommodation team and we can make sure they get the support they need and explain their options. This would normally include a fixed notice period for exiting as one option, for example. Uh, finally, whilst every year we know there are always a small number of students who wish to leave, many more prefer to stay. Indeed, throughout October and November this year, at least 100 students are still moving in to the accommodation. So in summary, we have altered the tenancy agreements in the summer in anticipation. And so the best thing to do is to get in touch with the accommodation team, accommodation at york.ac.uk, or tomorrow on the website forward slash accommodation and there's an online chat thing there and we'll do our best to help you. Thanks and and, and then there is this this wider point about um, students wanting uh, safe face-to-face -face teaching and, and actually that goes quite nicely into the third question most popular question so I'm, I'm going to add that in and I'm going to turn to Tracy I think. Um, so, so the third most popular question was that even when the university was delivering as much face-to-face -face teaching as possible, so before we moved into um, uh, that, that second tier for teaching, I only had three hours per week when I am usually used to 16 to 20 hours per week. How can the university expect students to warrant coming back to York and having to pay for the cost of living in, in York? when many students struggle to afford it anyway without COVID affecting our money. So this is really about students' hunger for face-to-face -face time with great academics. Tracy, Tracy, can you take that first, please? Yeah, I can. So I, I think let's move back a step. In a typical academic year, students have a, a different range of activities they can engage with. They have lectures, they have seminars, workshops, laboratories, tutorials, studio activities, supervision, and many more that academics create. We had to make a decision really early on to move all of our lectures online. We're not alone in this. All, if you look at other organisations, they've done this. And that's partly because um, student safety, health and wellbeing, and also it allows us to have much more space to, to deliver those smaller group experiences, which we were able to do while we're in tier one. And again, we've got lessons learned from over the summer. So we quickly had to move all of our lectures online. Oh, and we've done that. So. That's where we're at the moment. What we've tried to preserve in tier one is as much face to face as we can within the space that we've got available to us within that one metre plus distancing. And we've done that to the best of our abilities. And we've heard the great feedback we've had from students about that. And I know several colleagues here have been involved in that in-person teaching too. So that's what we've got to. As we move to that tier two, and we've made that decision as well to move to two metre distance. And this clearly has got implications for the amount of space we've got on campus. So as I said in the introduction, what we've done is we've worked really hard with academic departments to try and maintain as much face-to-face -face teaching on campus going forward for the rest of the academic term. That's going to have potentially different, um, in different modes to what um, we've already seen. So for example, it might be some pop-up sessions with professors coming to talk to them about a different range of activities. Some of them might be drop-in sessions and some of them might be group, more group activities, perhaps discussing dissertations or even wider hot topic debates themselves. So we've been creative with what we've been trying to do, but clearly that decision to move away from lectures early on has reduced the contact time, but it's also meant by having all of our lectures online, it doesn't matter whether students are self-isolating, whether they were able to, to get here from different parts of the world, they've all been able to have that rich York experience and experience those lectures that have been delivered by our staff. Thanks, and, and that, that leads us quite well to the next question where I'm gonna to turn to you, Charlie. Uh, that, that question is about, with, with that move to tier two and the, uh, I suppose the compromises that are necessary to face-to-face um, uh, -face teaching. Students, there's an inquiry here about uh, to what extent the university could reimburse students. Uh, Charlie, can you come in on that, please? Thanks very much, Ben, uh, and thanks for the question. 
Um, and and I, I understand where, where the question is, is coming from. Um, but I, I would say we are in a, a quite extraordinary situation, which is, which is bringing demands on us all, is putting us all into a, a very uh, different territory than that which we would normally have. Uh, and, and our response to that is to work uh, as hard as we can. And Trace has just given a, a, a sense of, uh, of the detailed conversations that have happened over the last several months uh, to adapt our education uh, as far as we need to. Uh, and it's, it's a higher need at the moment to online settings or to, to shift that balance between in-person and online, but to maintain the quality levels. We're, we're absolutely committed to you achieving the same outcomes that you would have had under other circumstances in, in different ways, but the same outcomes. Um, and uh, I, I, I have a, you know, a brilliant set of, of academic staff from, from, from postgraduates who teach to, to the most eminent professors who are working extremely hard in doing so. Uh, and and I, I still have to pay them. Uh, and the way which I, I pay them is primarily through, uh, through student fees. So there's, a, there's a, another balance there, which we, we all have to, to think about. We are still working with brilliant academics, brilliant teachers, working in different ways, but providing uh, in the, the, the same uh, learning outcomes, but also uh, the same costs of delivery. Um, so that's my my way of answering your your question. Uh, we're working very hard in different ways, but also with the same cost base uh, that we need to cover. Um, for those students who are here on campus and you know, in the city and feel safe and, and, and so forth, and, and they are hungering for face to face opportunities, even you know, albeit they they accept that they're currently restricted. Presumably, there's lots they can do outside of the classroom. I, I want to go to Matt on this. So, Matt, Matt, what advice would you have for a student who hasn't got as much face-to-face -face teaching as they might hope right now? How, how can you advise them to try and get the most out of life at York? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> obviously, the library is still open and has bookable study spaces. Um, so, you are more than welcome to use um any of the bookable spaces on campus to study outside of your room just to try and get out of the space where you have to sometimes eat but also sleep and study uh which really isn't good for anyone um there are also sessions being run in the library uh online as well um with the academic skills community um where you can just meet people who are also studying um and it can be really great to understand that there are people going through the almost the exact same situation um and it really really helps to nullify some of those fears um, across the rest of the campus obviously you can spend some time in one of our many campus venues um most notably the forest if you want to meet people outside of your immediate household um and there are events like live music in the forest on sundays from our own band sock uh, speaking of societies, uh, we of course have 237 societies operating and 67 sports teams trying to, trying to do their best. Um, so there's a whole lot to get involved with. Um, and of course, if you're not on campus, you can get involved online as well. Thanks ever so much. Um, uh, the next question that I've spotted here is about, uh, so it's a student asking whether there are any uh, ideas to bring in something similar to the what was called the student safety net, a policy that, that, that was used last academic year. Um, so they've, they've said, yeah, is, is, there, is there any possibility of bringing in something similar to the safety net this year, as even though we've had time to prepare for the new way of learning, it's still really difficult. Um, for example, the increased anxiety people have got about the possibility of students grieving over lost, loss of loved ones or, or change to do with COVID. And this might really affect students' grades. Am I best off going around to Tracy for that, please? Yeah, so that, that's a really good question. And, and I think it, it's, it's helpful that it's already drawn on the fact that we've been more prepared for this new way of learning this year. So again, to recap to the position we found ourselves in last academic year, we had to go into that national lockdown very quickly. That meant departments, it wasn't just about the teaching and learning, but it was about having to change assessment formats very last minute and moving to online assessments, which for many disciplines um, we've not done, and moving exams from those traditional formats that we know to online exams as well. 
So we worked as quickly as we could over the summer period to do that. But then we did bring in the safety net, the no detriment policy. And I think we need to bear in mind as well, we also did something similar for PGT students that took into account the impact on the dissertation too. This year we have had more time to plan. So it's not just been about the teaching and learning and, and the activities that students are already seeing now. It's also about the assessment strategies we've put in place as well. And again, departments have had time now to think about how they assess um, the, the learning that, that students are undertaking in the most appropriate way, whether that is online exams, or whether it's more coursework. So we've adapted our assessment policies already and our assessment practices in order to take into account the situation we find ourselves in. I think a second point is, and, and, and I think Ben, you raised about with students suffering from anxiety and, and perhaps grieving for, for, for um, relatives, etc. Need to remember we've got the exceptional circumstances affecting assessment policy. This is something we have all the time irrespective of COVID and it's exactly for those instances that you've raised in that question about when students are suffering from anxiety. When something's gone wrong, it's there to mitigate against that. So that policy is there, it's been updated for COVID and we will continue to review this policy as we go through the year. Again, we've got excellent resources that, that Paula can talk about in terms of if students are facing challenges with, with coping with their learning. We've got the Open Door team, we've got excellent resources there. So Paula might want to come in with more on this, but just to say we will obviously keep an eye on what's going on in the situation with, with the assessment as we move through that. And if we have to make adjustments, we will do, and we'll clearly communicate those to students. But we've done everything we can at the moment to make sure that we are prepared to not have to bring in a safety net policy, but if we have to do, and we see an awful lot of loss of learning, clearly we would adapt as we go through the academic year. Th thanks for that, Tracy. Matt, Matt uh, you gave me a little nudge there in the, in the chat column. Have you, have you got a point you wanted to add there, please? Yeah, uh, so looking at the changes to the, the exceptional circumstances policy, I think there are still some changes in a more positive light to students that could be made. Um, and it's something that we as students unions are pushing for a little bit because we understand that this is just one giant exceptional circumstance. Um, this is by no means something which is becoming the new normal, we hope. Um, this is not something which, while ongoing, is going to help with our studies, frankly, quite the opposite. Um, and, you know, obviously there is loads of support available for everyone, but I think there's a lot to be said for a slightly relaxed slightly more relaxed than there currently is exceptional circumstances policy around this. Uh, thanks for that, Matt. And, and uh, I'm sure those are representations you'll be making on behalf of students in a number of committees as well. Um, I'm going to press straight on to the next question, if that's all right, because they're coming thick and fast. There's a really interesting one here, which I take it is perhaps from a, a returning student. Um, and they've said further strike action could be too much for many students, especially myself as a fourth year. Um, this would be my fourth bout of strike action. Uh, what are you as senior managers going to do to prevent the rumoured upcoming strikes? I think I should turn to you first, Charlie. I, I may not be the best person to talk to about that. Uh, you may need to talk to representatives of the universities and colleges union. Um, but let, let me say that I am um, very... Uh, very closely engaged with the executive committee of, of the UCU um, uh, here at York. I meet with them uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, my director of HR meets uh, with representatives on a weekly basis. The director of health and safety meets with representatives on a weekly basis. Uh, and Tracy, who's on this call, um, has been uh, deeply engaged in, in working with those representatives in uh, in thinking through some of the issues around our transition to the Department for Higher Education, uh, Department for Education uh, Tier Two, uh, so we, we do have a, a strong and close relationship. We we work through issues together. Um, that there, there are, uh, I, I I understand, and, and you can see this in in the national debate, uh, a number of national level campaigns which the UCU is pursuing. Uh, I'm not sure they're always reflected um, in the quality of local uh, level relationships. Uh, um, my, my ambition, my commitment is to keep those local level relationships uh, strong. Um, we, we have worked very closely together over the last uh, six months, much more so uh, than, uh, than before COVID. 
Uh, and, and in my conversations with, with those in other universities, it's a more intense and collaborative relationship uh, than many other universities are, are seeing. Um, so I, I hope that that commitment to collaboration, to talking through issues is, is one which will uh, avoid that circumstance here at the University of York. That's helpful, Charlie. Did, um, if I can just hone in a little bit. So, so obviously we've got this um, uh, short period where we're resetting the clock as, as, as part of uh, uh, this phase two, uh, tier two uh, approach. And you, you shared with us a bit about how you're hoping to adapt the, the classrooms and the spaces and the approach to enable face-to-face -to, -face to continue. What sense do you get from uh, the trade union branches locally that they're going to work with the students and the institution on, on bringing face to face safely back and that they're going to be comfortable with that, you know, after this, this, this intervening period, if you want? Well, uh, again, we, we, we should look back at what we have gone through already. So, so all of the preparations for teaching um, on, on the resumption on, in, in the new academic year uh, were made on the basis of risk assessments. Those risk assessments are run through um, uh, at the top level, a health, self, safety and, uh, and welfare committee, which is uh, convened by the director of, uh, of, of health and safety uh, with uh, union representatives, not just the UCU, the other two unions with, with representation on campus. Uh, and then we set up effectively a subcommittee of that committee to work on a weekly basis uh, so all of the all of the decisions that we made were made uh, with uh, with and through uh, that system, uh, and any decisions that we make in future will be made with and through that system. It is intensive, um, you know, and, and, and sometimes in industrial relations issues are, are handled in uh, in different ways at a kind of campaigning level than they are on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, I can assure you that the day-to-day -day level is, is one on which there are very good relationships. Thank you ever so much, Charlie. Um, the next most popular question is, is about the health impacts of, of COVID-19. Um, so it says, considering the serious impact of COVID-19 and surrounding policy to students' mental health in some cases, what urgent measures are the university considering to combat this? I think if it's all right, I'll go around to Paula, please. Thanks, Ben. Yes, I mean, absolutely, we understand that for, for everybody concerned, I think students and staff alike, it's such a strange time that we're living through and with that, that it's having an impact on, on everybody. And I think it's the cumulative impact as well that, that we recognise is happening. But we want you to know that, that there are people here to help. We have got teams of staff uh, working with Open Door. We've also got wellbeing officers working with academic departments. Uh, and we also have um, an online community through Together All, which is available as an international community and it's accessible to students um, 24 hours a day, um, seven days a week. And that, that does provide anonymity for those who maybe don't feel ready to, to share directly with, with, with people yet about their anxieties. But um, those teams are, are, are connecting with students as our college teams as well. So I think on all sorts of levels, as well as within their academic department, that, that there are people there to, to help you and hopefully to help work through some of those anxieties and give some strategies. We can't give false hope um, because none of us know where, where things are going to end here in terms of the timescales. But it is to explain that and sometimes just to know that you're not on your own in having these feelings. Of, of, of anxiety and, and you know those who are feeling you know the separation of, of perhaps ones that they've lost as well so so we have made a big commitment as a university to to well-being um, and also an investment that's gone in this term around those new roles that I just mentioned around the well-being offices that are working directly with academic departments to try and make sure we've got that connectivity between one and the other um, so if it helps as well, we've got some upcoming talks um, that, that we've themed around areas around helping people to deal with things like perfectionism, which can be a recurring theme that students have, have been struggling with. Um, 
and, and there's a program of events that, that is on. I think there's one yesterday around sleep and trying to help you sleep and that'll be available uh, for you to catch up on if you didn't manage to engage with that. Um, I don't know, Carly uh, and, and Perna, whether there's other things you'd want to add as well um, around some of that well-being activity that, that's, that's there to support. Yeah, um, so I mean, we, we know that the from a Pulse survey this week that that actually when we asked uh, around about 1500 students about where they turn for support, um, departments was a significant answer. I'm going to come to you in a second on that, Jill, but also peers, uh, you know, other students and colleagues w w was a really important source of, of support. So um, Carly and then Perna, if you can both talk about how we can help students to help one another, please. I was thinking that youth have been working on a variety of schemes to try and really engage that peer to peer support. So we've been working in collaboration with Student Minds to in what's called our mental health champions, and they've been trained to sort of um, guide that support and that mental health literacy and that peer to peer support. We've also got a youth through mentoring process uh, program that came in after with the pandemic, where youth launched a mentoring scheme for young people that either from underrepresented groups or those that have been experiencing social isolation. We've also been working with some specific departments where we've seen in particular concentrated areas of mental health issues. Um, those people that tend to struggle to integrate anyway, A, I know we've been working closely and doing a computer science buddy in collaboration with that department specifically. On top of that, we've got our liberation networks, we've got all these communities. And as we said in that pulse survey, most students are feeling okay. There is those ones that had pre-existing conditions things we've got to it's the array of students and the biggest thing students are feeling is that isolation and that being alone and the biggest thing we can do to support the student is support those communities and support them in engaging with those communities whether in isolation or otherwise um and the biggest thing that we need to do in terms of those more severe cases where people are experiencing real problems and may need clinical help is just the signposting that's the biggest problem we have at the university we have so many fantastic i love working with the conduct and respect team the amount of work that they do is fantastic but it's just getting the word out there because sometimes students just don't know where to go and that's the biggest thing that we've got to work on as a university and union. Shall I go next? Yeah. Yes please. Um, 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 I think I will kind of repeat what Paul and Kylie just said. At the University of York there is a holistic approach in terms of mental health. Um, like there are plenty of services available at USU, GSA, University, um, Open Door Team, Student Support Team, we are tackling um, students' issues on a broader areas, um, whereas like at the USU and GSA, it's mostly on academic side. At the Open Door team, it falls under the uh, mental health mostly. But we also acknowledge that um, it's important to keep a peer support during this time. Therefore, we increase at the GSA, we increase our network provision to 12. So there are now um, five more networks than it was last year. Uh, and we have already seen signups around 1,500 um, 1, students to these networks because students would like to get together. And also Calabra has been working with the university uh, in, for the forthcoming mental health strategy. So if you have any um, comments on that, let us know, we will make sure that it will be included. Thank you. And then quickly to, to Jill, we, we know that departments are, are a, a kind of really high trust place for students to turn when they, when they want support and, and welfare advice. Can you talk briefly about the sorts of stuff that's available in their department? Absolutely. Um, the most obvious one is personal supervisors, but I just want to foreground the way in which departments have been working with wellbeing officers. We um, encourage staff to um, attend mental health awareness training. So your academic staff are engaging with that sort of provision in order that they can then spot things when they come up. And from an academic perspective, then our kind of approaches to modular delivery, delivery this year have really tried to focus on building community. So we've been kind of foregrounding study groups, um, collaborative work. We've got the academic skills community, which is launched this year, which has got collaborative groups you can avoid, but you can join. So we're just trying to avoid um, loneliness, really. But your academics are, are well aware that these are issues for you. Thank you. Um, now, I've, I've got a whole bunch of questions on, on accommodation a, 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 again, and, and so I'm going to try and group a whole load together. Um, 
uh, a lot of these are about how the eight weeks notice period might work in practice. So uh, please could you let us know why students who signed accommodation contracts to start January, March for the current academic year are being charged eight weeks rent for cancellation despite not having moved in. Given the university itself is moving up tiers now and even when timetables were released just before the last week of September, there were but four hours of face-to-face -face sessions. How could students have been expected to cancel earlier? Um, uh, some stuff around the burden of weight of, of, of uh, one and a half thousand pounds on top of everything that's going on. Um, I, I guess really the question is about in an environment where things are changing quite rapidly, um, uh, how would an eight week notice period work for a student who hasn't even started yet? And the thing that they signed up to might, might have changed before they even get here. Um, is that best to go to, to Dean again in the first instance, please? Thank you, Ben. And for the question, it's a really thought provoking question. There's a few observations that come to mind, really. It's generally good practice to issue a tenancy agreement so that uh, somebody moving in, me or you, know what to expect from our landlord, who to report repair requests to, where to pay their rent to make sure it's fairly controlled, and where to make complaints and positive feedback to as well. In terms of the eight week notice period, that's new for this year. Uh, many other universities and many other providers don't have a notice period and hold students to their tenancy agreements so that the only way to leave is to leave a course or to find a replacement. What we, we want to do better, better than that at York. So we introduced an eight week notice period. But again, by contacting the accommodation team, we see that as kind of in the majority, the longest period that it will take. Um, we're able to usually um, release students from their tenancy agreement, their contract a lot earlier than that. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, there are still students trying to move in who want to come and live with us. So we're able to do replacements a little bit quicker, but we are always really interested in talking to people directly about special cases uh, to do our very, very best to, to help. And again, those contact details are accommodation at york.ac.uk, online chat forward slash accommodation, or um, the, uh, the help desk on double five, double five, but we're here to help. Thanks for that, Dean. Um, Carly, I, I know you've received quite a lot of queries from students asking about, you know, or, or starting to think about accommodation for the next academic year from, from some, summer next year. Um, uh, can you talk to us about, you know, some of the conversations you've been having and how you're advising them, please? So obviously, we just talked about a bit about tenancy agreements there and what your rights are and how you are tied into that contract. One of the big things that we're trying to encourage students to do is not to sign on to a contract yet. Feel free to start looking, feel free to start finding those groups that you want to sit in, because obviously things might change and circumstances might change and you need a good group that you feel that you can trust in moving into a new property together, particularly if you're moving off campus to other accommodation. Um, and as such, I've been working with YSJ to try and start a campaign. It's still very much its preliminary phase and we'll be hoping to release that in the next couple of weeks, saying not to rent yet. If you rent now, if you sign your contract now, you'll be tied in to all the legalities of that contract. You'll be tied in with the people that you sign on with, on with, and your circumstances personally might change. We've seen it a lot happen. And as much as we've got control over campus and can in, try and get you in and out as fast as possible, other landlords may not be that engaged and may not release you and will hold you to those. So the longer you can you can wait, um, a, it also influences the market. If we have a mass of students who don't sign on and landlords are scared and they're worrying about trying to get people into their properties, it'll affect prices, it'll affect the quality of accommodation and, and push them to try and make sure they're being a better landlord when you do eventually sign on to that contract. So the, all students that don't sign on before Christmas and wait till afterwards, the better a deal and the more flexibility you can get in your contract. A big part of that is one, you won't be tied in and if your circumstances change and you do end up wanting to move home or not wanting to come back and study in person next year, you're not tied into that. And the second thing is that you need to spend the time getting to know your rights as a consumer and as a renter in these properties. And that's what I'd really encourage you to do over Christmas. Um, one of the questions that I've heard uh, a number of times from a number of different people over the last week is, is about whether it's possible for the university to um, 
try and help students gain some confidence and clarity in the medium term, despite all of the changes. So, so one of the examples that, that I heard recently was a student saying, should we uh, move to all online for the remainder of term one so people can start to plan around a change for term two? Or, or, or uh, you know, potentially talking about a policy that might get us through a long dark winter to a, a summer term three where it might be uh, that you know, the, the, the virus might have changed and we might feel more optimistic. Ch Charlie, can you talk about how we can, you know, how we can start to try and think a bit more medium term? Um, well, that's that's extraordinarily difficult when the situation around us is changing uh, in in a very unpredictable way. Um, what we've done in introducing the, the 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 Department for Education Tier Two measures is is something that I hope is resilient to some of those changes and can enable us to uh, to plan ahead. But I can't rule out next week the Prime Minister saying there will be a national circuit breaker or some kind of national lockdown which um, throws all the cards up into the air. So I, I, I think it's a situation where we where we cannot um, give uh, that certainty. Uh, what we can do is is to uh, to be clear uh, that we value uh, in-person education. Uh, we think this is pedagogically important important in an educational sense. We think it's also important for for well-being. Uh, for students to be able to engage um, beyond um, their, their domestic circumstance, whatever that might be. Uh, I think there are tremendous benefits to that. Um, it, it's also very clear that um, uh, students from more disadvantaged backgrounds have that disadvantage often compounded uh, if they're not um, studying in a university uh, setting. So there are lots and lots of reasons why we will fight really, really hard to maintain uh, an in-person uh, experience. Um, we should also note that um, something approaching half of the, uh, the, the academic programmes uh, that we run uh, require uh, physical presence that cannot be reproduced online for, for clinical purposes, uh, for laboratory-based subjects and for performance-based subjects. Um, these are things which cannot really be uh, reproduced. So we must find ways uh, of continuing uh, an in-person uh, experience. So again, we will do what we can, uh, despite the circumstances changing around us, uh, to maintain as much of that in-person experience uh, as possible. Thank you for that. Um, we, we are starting to run out of time, so we're, we're going to have to try and squeeze two more in quickly if we can. Um, uh, men mental health is, is coming up a, a lot again, so I'm, I'm, I want to turn to one of those uh, significant mental health questions. Um, so uh, again, I'm, I'm reading the question pretty much verbatim here. Um, it, it seems ridiculous to suggest that only people with pre-existing mental health conditions can be affected by the pandemic. I know many people who have developed mental health concerns due to going from having the freedom of transport and spending most of their time out of accommodation at sports, societies and lectures who are now shut in a small room and can't even visit their families. There's not enough support for people on and off campus to help with mental health concerns due to changes in life at university. I mean, it's a statement rather than a question, but, but I guess, um, Paula, can I ask you to just, is there any further thing you can elaborate that, that's about both those who have perhaps clinical needs, but those who have, so, you know, perhaps just feel lonely or, or struggling to sleep? You've touched on it already, but can you, can you tell us anything more on that, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. And I, I guess just, just I, I appreciate you said it was a statement, but I, I hope that certainly from what was said previously, nobody's taken the impression that we're suggesting that it's only people who have got pre-existing mental health conditions that are affected by COVID. I, I guess my point was that it's affecting all of us, um, you know, staff and students. It's something that everybody's going through. Um, so in, in terms of the, the specifics uh, that, that you raise around uh, trying to, to deal with perhaps that loneliness and that change, I think, you know, colleagues have mentioned already that there is a variety of, of opportunities for students to engage and it, and it has been, you know, it was so encouraging to hear Ben yourself and, and, and your two colleagues mentioning as well, you know, the, the significant increase that there was in the sign up to student societies. So I think I would encourage students to, to join 
join in with wherever they feel that connection and that connectivity to try to make some of those 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 friendship groups i think i'd also to note that within colleges we are extending the a connecting people project where again we're just trying to work as much as we can and and that's important within that peer group as well to try to ensure that everybody's got somebody that they can connect with that is a, a peer support as well as the more formal um, interventions that might be available through the sorts of services that are available and that we've talked about um, and I think you know, do, do speak to the college teams that are there, you know, do reach out to us because I think it's somewhere there will be somebody we can help, we can help to connect students with um, because, you know, as I said, it is the strangest of times and it's, it's understandable that people are feeling um, sad because of it and, and isolated because of it but um, I think it's just to, to, to reinforce the fact that people are not on their own in having those feelings um, I think it's something that to, to one degree or another we've all asked ourselves the question about. Thanks Paula I'm squeezing in a, a really quick one now uh, before we wrap up and it's a question about why we are all here and that's about learning and attaining. Um, someone has said why are my lectures now around one hour and 40 minutes. The workload is increasing beyond my reach and I'm worried about falling behind in my studies. Uh, Tracy, I think I should turn to you, please. Thanks, and that's an interesting question. So uh, um, as an aside, I'd be keen to perhaps hear more about this and to see where that was falling so we could work with that department in particular to understand more about this. Um, I think, I mean, Paul has alluded to this. If students are finding, and Jill as well, as students, if you're finding you're struggling with your work, please reach out to members of staff, whether that's your academic supervisor, whether it's your personal supervisor, whether it's your college teams, whether it's UCU GSA, reach out to somebody and talk to try and understand what those issues are. So that's the first point, talk to somebody about it. Um, I think secondly as well, I think Matt's alluded to the fact we do have this exceptional circumstances policy that we, we need to now go back and revisit and welcome working with, with the, the unions on this as well. But look at that too. Um, there's ways if students are struggling with their workload to flag it, there's ways we can mitigate, we, there's ways we can get extensions for assessments. So again, but please reach out to us. We've got an awful, um, a lot of knowledge. We've got some fantastic resources out there, but we need to understand what those problems are. So please get in touch with us further on that. Thanks so much, Tracy. Um, uh, look, I, I'm going to wrap up. I, I mean, I, I should say a huge thank you to, to, to an expert panel who, who, who shared their thoughts and observations with you. I should say a huge thank you, thank you to the students who submitted uh, loads and loads of, of great questions. I wanted to close by um, encouraging you all to remember that you aren't alone. You're a member of an 18,000 plus strong student community here at the University of York. Um, you've got around 5,000 staff across the university and the two students' unions who are here to, to, to support you, to try and uh, help you to achieve the most you possibly can, to help you uh, uh, gain memories and friends that will last long into your future. You're part of almost 200,000 people who, who live in our beautiful city of York, this wonderful, comparatively safe, historic city. You are not alone. If you want to see how other students are navigating this really unusual environment, um, then I encourage you to visit the USU website, that's yusu.org, and search for the Life in Lockdown series where some of our students are sharing their feelings and their experiences about how they're navigating uh, the current environment. And if you think you're a student who could help others to get by and get on in this environment, um, then perhaps you'd consider standing to be a college representative um, or an academic rep because we are looking for nominees for those two positions right now. Uh, you can go on to the USU website uh, where you'll be able to nominate yourselves, uh, but you will need to do that by tomorrow afternoon, please. Uh, that's yusu.org. And for those of you who were asking about the data on coronavirus cases, 
please do go to the university website um, and on there you can click a link to get to their coronavirus web pages where they are daily updating all of the stats and data about those who are quarantining um, uh, and those who, who are positive uh, cases. Thanks ever so much for joining us this evening. Look after yourselves and look after each other. Good night. <laughs>